Um, without further ado, I would like to introduce, um, well, actually, I'm going to have our, my speakers introduce themselves. We have four experienced hemp farmers here, and um, I'm really grateful to them for, you know, taking some time tonight to talk to us about their experiences. And I've got a bunch of questions here that I'm going to be asking them. And as I mentioned, if you have, um, if you have some questions, please put them in the chat box and David's gonna to try to keep up, uh, keep track of those and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can um, after the panel discussion. So, um, panel members, um, can you please uh, introduce yourself? And then um, also when you introduce yourself, um, just tell us how you got involved with hemp. What was the, how, how did you end up here? Um, and we do have a bunch of questions, so we're going to try to keep um, answers, you know, uh, to just a couple of minutes for each of the questions. So, um, Andrew, would you please kick us off? Sure. Yeah, I'm uh, Andrew Bishop of Egg Processing Solutions in North Central Montana. Um, I'm also a dry land hemp farmer. Um, we farmed hemp to, to kind of try it out and try out different varieties and see what would grow best uh, in our region. Um, we were lucky enough actually to grow 12 foot tall hemp plants on only three inches of rain from May through October. Um, and we, we tried a, a couple different varieties and a bunch of different seeding rates and fertilizer rates just to see what would work best in our, uh, in our area. Um, and so, yeah, I'm Andrew Bishop, Egg Processing Solutions. We design hemp processing facilities and we also farm, so. Great, thanks. How about Charlie? Oh, you're muted. <laughs> hey, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Charlie Levine, I'm the owner of Hemp Acres. Um, sorry if my computer has a fan that's very noisy, so I'll just try to speak over it if, it's, if you hear it. Um, but, uh, but yeah, we're located in, in Waconia, Minnesota, which is just south of the Twin Cities. Um, and uh, I got involved in 2016 once uh, Minnesota adopted a pilot program and um, saw a need for, for processing. And I've uh, been farming since I was little and, and background in, in, uh, in construction. And so I took uh, an existing shed on our farm and turned it into a food grade facility and just started diving deep into uh, the processing uh, technologies that exist for making food from grain and um and then we get involved in cbd um and we grow on our farm as well just a small uh, organic operation um but the grain side has has taken off and we've uh, acquired thirty-seven thousand square feet here in laconia that we're um, currently building out and should be open uh hopefully july 1st and uh, basically scaled up all of our grain processing for, um, for human food consumption. So hearts, oil, proteins, seeds, um, and that's, uh, that's what our main focus is. And uh, we are also adding a fiber separation uh, this summer as well uh, and contracting about two to 3,000 acres for um, grain and fiber production throughout the Midwest. So we're wholesale ingredient manufacturers of, of hemp. Uh, all the hemp products that come out of the field. Great, thanks. Um, Gator. Hey, I'm Gator Williams from Lazy Gators Hemp Farm here in Kentston, North Carolina. I uh, started farming in 17 when North Carolina adapted the uh, pilot program for the hemp. I got into it uh, on the CBD side of things from a personal injury. <clears throat> I had surgery and, and looked alternative uh, treatments, holistic treatments to pain medic medication. Uh, first in the state to, to, to receive a license um, and build a vertical company off of that uh, with my CBD experience. Uh, and the gist of that, I met some people on the fiber side. We planted 1,300 acres of fiber in 18. I uh, had a hurricane come through, wiped the whole crop out. So I've learned a lot of what you don't do is more so <laughs> what you need to do. Um, 
but during this planning and and experiencing these, these hardships through this time we also endured the process inside of things it, it weren't in place so we built a textile facility for fine open fibers uh, to go towards the textiles so that's currently where we're at we built a we got a 30,000 square foot warehouse here in Kinston that we build it in and working with a biofuel uh, looking to plant close to a thousand acres this year textile grade fibers also r and d in the gra uh, grain side of things great thank you and bob pierce i'm bob pierce uh, i'm uh, an extension specialist at the university of kentucky most of my career has been in uh, tobacco production uh, we started in 2014 in Kentucky with a hemp program. Uh, I got involved in 2016 and was named the uh, uh, interim director for hemp programs at our college uh, in 2019. Uh, we conduct research on all aspects of hemp production, grain, fiber, uh, floral production as well. Um, and so we've done a number of trials, uh, variety trials over the years, uh, management, fertility, uh, harvesting, you name it, we've done uh, a lot of those things. So I appreciate the opportunity to be here uh, with you this evening and look forward to trying to answer some of your questions. Yeah, thanks for being here. Okay, so let's get started. Um, the next, let's, um, I'm gonna, let's just use that same order for answering the next few questions. Um, Cause I'm gonna ask each of you to respond to each of the next, you know, three or four questions. Um, let's start with um, selecting genetics. What has your, what is your, pro, what, um, you know, recognizing that you've been through maybe several years of, um, of this process this year, what was your process for selecting genetics, and um, and uh, have you do you feel like you have found some genetics that are working well for for you, or or what is your feeling about um, the availability of, of good genetics for for fiber, and and please identify uh, um, identify if you're specifically talking about grain or fiber um, production. So Andrew, you can you can start. Sure. Yeah, we we grew X fifty nine in a variety, and that's that's for grain. Um, and then we also grew a variety that I call Jinma, but I'm sure that's not pronounced correctly. It's J I N M A. Um, it's a Chinese variety. Um, that variety uh, did go hot on us, and the X fifty nine did really well though. Um, we selected those varieties simply because. Um, the processor, we, we designed a, a hemp crush facility um, and hemp art line for a processor that was located nearby us. And those are the two varieties that they wanted to experiment with, with and see what different uh, seed and fertilizer rates would do for our, um, different varieties. So, you know, my best advice to people that are looking at different varieties is try to find cheap seed, first of all, but also good seed that doesn't go hot, which uh, is a tall task um, given where we are in the seed market. So, Charlie, do you want to? Um, yeah. So when it comes to um, you know grain and 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 fiber, I I say that like you know most industrial varieties are dual purpose. Um, so even like a phenola variety that is only getting about three or four feet tall, um, you'll still have, um, you know, like a one to two feet of stubble and you have to take care of that. Um, we learned a hard way with uh, trying to work that back into the ground and, and um, it just caused serious wrapping and clumping, with even discs and rippers. And, and so, um, so basically you're left with two options to either bail it um, or burn it. And so we, we suggest, you know, bail it because we, we want to buy it. Um, and so we're, we're, you know, like Panola variety, you can see, you know, anywhere from like one ton less per acre. Um, and then dual variety crops that are getting like six feet plus tall, you can see, you know, two to three tons per acre. Um, and, uh, 
and then for grain you're you're seeing like a 1500 pound average per acre and that's you know that's really focused on our climate conditions and soil conditions um i'm sure it varies more depending on where you are but uh yes yeah, so that's that's kind of what what we're seeing seeing for yields and all crops other than like an auto flower variety um are going to be you're, you're going to get fiber off of it so um so yeah and uh i mean there's you know genetics come down to it that it's going to take a long time for for it to catch up um because we've had such a delay in, in developing this this crop um, but like the autoflower varieties, I think have a big future for food and medicines and uh, the quick maturity rate and the height that it gets. Um, there's a lot of opportunities to multi-crop in a single year. Um, so yeah, it'll, it'll be exciting to see what happens with genetics and we're working on a couple different things and uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, you need to know where to source your, your seed. So um, can you for uh, can you just explain what what you mean when you say dual purpose? Uh, for grain and fiber, and then I mean, there's what we're working on this year too as uh, is a tri crop. So you can, um, and what we've seen is that uh, the CBD varieties will um, you can let them get seeded out, and they'll still produce like eight to ten percent CBD. So um, we're taking a completely different approach at this um, by, you know, mo other than smokable flour, it's all going to be turned into oil anyway. So um, the amount of oil that you can yield if you plant a higher density is it's much higher than if you were to transplant and do everything by hand. Um, yeah. So you can also get, so you get grain, biomass and then stocks out of one crop. Okay um, and also for the benefit of the group who may not know the term um, when Charlie says auto flowering that just means that there's a determined amount of time where the for the plant to mature versus it being um, uh, triggered by an amount of daylight which is most hemp um, is is triggered by so that's actually that could be a great benefit um, you know because yeah because many many genetics won't do well like standard varieties won't do well further south because they're photosensitive so they'll have a lot of time you know trouble growing whereas like an autoflower as soon as it shoots out of the ground it'll go straight into flowering mode and you'll see like anywhere between like a 50 to 80 day maturity opposed to like 120 day maturity Gotcha. Um, okay, so Gator, do you have something to, do you, do you want to tell us about what your process for, for choosing genetics is? It's been difficult here in our region, <clears throat> in the southeast uh, coastal part of North Carolina. We've endured uh, with seed from Canada, uh, uh, Europe. This year we've got a Ukrainian variety that we're testing for them and also running a Chinese Gem Ma, uh, doing tests on it. We've got three different, we got Gem Ma, Puma, and Yuma uh, that we're running to, to do tests on as far as uh, the fiber production versus herd and the, the grain side of things as well. The northern genetics, we have issues with them going straight to flower as soon as they emerge. So we focused on finding one that matched our latitude as much as possible. Uh, that's our biggest issue, finding the ge proper genetics. Because as uh, Charlie said, that northern grain or, or genetic will not adapt to this until, unless you run it multiple grow seasons and, and get acclimated to this area. So that, it's been a challenge in our region. Gotcha. Bob, how about you? Yeah, sure. Um, Kelly, if I get carried away, just throw up a stop sign and tell me to. Okay. Stop, so. <laughs> well, I've got, I mean, we'll, uh, I've got questions that are probably going to cover everything we want to know. So um, All right. stick to genetics. <laughs> well, I, I, 
I've been doing I've been doing these cultivar trials for several years now and, and had the opportunity to test up to 17, 18 uh, cultivars at one time. And uh, Gator's exactly right with the challenge that you're going to face, especially in, in South Carolina and the South. Uh, we have that issue in Kentucky, too, is the, is the photo period sensitivity. And so you look, most of these cultivars have been developed in areas that are, are well north of it. Even the, uh, the, the European varieties, uh, I mean, where I'm at in Lexington, we sit about the southern, southern boot of Italy, you know, down around the toe, the toe of Italy. And so um, most of these cultivars have been developed pretty far north of us. So uh, for fiber, uh, you're going to struggle to find something that will bloom late enough because for fiber, you want a late blooming period so you get as much salt development as possible before it goes into, uh, into flower. Probably your best bet on fiber is going to be one of the Chinese lines, uh, Jin Ma uh, or Zhu Ma or one of those, Uma. Um, the problem with those is that they do tend to be unstable from a compliance standpoint. And uh, I think it was mentioned about uh, the, the Jin Ma going hot. Uh, that's been a pretty common occurrence uh, with it. Um, so you have to watch that one pretty closely as far as that's concerned. On the grain side, uh, we've had some better luck uh, with some of the Canadian uh, varieties. Uh, we've also had some pretty good luck with some cultivars that are coming out of New West Genetics in, uh, in Colorado. So those are some things that you might wanna consider with that when you're looking at grain. Uh, height is not as important to you. And so even though the Canadian varieties flower pretty early here, uh, they only get about two or three feet tall, which actually makes them easier to harvest uh, from, a, from a grain standpoint. So uh, definitely want to try to do your homework a little bit. Uh, looking at some of the varieties that out, are out there, there's not a lot of variety trial information out there. Uh, but I think you know, over the next year or two, we'll see that, uh, certainly see that improve. One thing I will mention real quickly about the uh, the, the double and triple cropping. We have to be a little bit careful with that in that you know, we know that our, our fiber quality kind of peaks right as the, the flower, the female flower is starting to form. So if we're harvesting grain um, from, that, uh, from that plant and then also the harvesting the, the fiber, uh, we might have to realize that, that we may take a slightly lower fiber quality um, by having you know, both those products come off. And kind of the same thing with, with uh, if we're trying to do CBD off of that or, or doing the essential oils off of that as well. Uh, when, we, when we let it go to, uh, go to seed, we may be losing or giving up some of that. So it's, there's trade-offs in there. And you have to look at the, the, the economics of those trade-offs to determine you know, whether or not a dual or triple cropping system um, makes sense. Great, thank you. Okay, so um, you've got your seed. Um, let's talk about what's happening in the field. Um, what is happening in, in your field in the fall prior to your planting and then also in the spring um, before seeds go in the ground? Uh, what's the total acreage that you're, you're working with? Um, what are you doing to, to, um, to prepare your fields? And also, if you could touch a little bit on the fertility um, programs that you have sort of settled on. Yeah, so, you know, for us in Montana, we're, we're quite a bit different, of course, than uh, the Southern US. Um, you know, we, we actually saw success um, <laughs> with some farmers out here that actually, had a volunteer crop of hemp that came up um, similar to what you'd see as a winter wheat crop in Montana. So in other words, it, this hemp plant survived uh, the entire winter um, and then it, uh, you know, it, it came up. And so, you know, what, what we're seeing right now is that, you know, a pulse crop or something like that prior to seeding hemp, um, you know, does work out pretty well. Um, when we 
when we put our uh, hemp in the ground, we we put a lot of uh, urea on, on it as well. And we tried different seeding rates and fertilizer rates. What we stuck with in Montana that worked the best was a seeding rate of about 45 pounds the acre um, for our grain varieties. Um, that seemed to seem to yield the best for us. Now that's going to be different with everyone, right, in different locations. But all I can speak to is what what our experiences was, and and uh, we we seem to we seem to like about 200 pounds of urea and 45 pounds the acre. We tried anywhere from 30 to 90 as well, just to see what differences we would see. Um, yeah, and I think, uh, and, and we, we have a couple thousand acres to play with. Um, we, we typically just seed, uh, last year, I guess we just did 20 acres. I'm trying to talk my dad into doing uh, quite a bit more this year, but with other commodity prices rising, it's a tough ask for farmers that are conservative um, you know, with their money to, to plant hemp. And that's something that a lot of this industry is missing right now is that, you know, being able to forward contract, at least in our area, $7 a bushel winter wheat, it's, it's tough to convince your farmer to, to grow hemp, so. Mm -hmm. What are you doing to, um, um, how are you prepping the fields? Are you um, like cultivation wise and are, are you cover cropping in between? No, we're not. So we're so we're we're kind of funny up here in Montana. Um, we usually let our fields lie fallow um, in between. Uh, we, we sometimes would put a pulse crop in, um, and that would be what I would recommend is like a pulse crop, like a lentil or a pea in our area um, the year prior to to growing hemp. And as far as preparation in the field, we're just direct direct drilling it into the ground, um, and we're we're trying to. You know, we're in between a, an inch to half inch or so on our uh, on our hoe. And, uh, you know, we, we didn't even use our air, big air seeder because our air seeder has problems with soil depth. And we had a lot of issues with soil compaction and, and actually the hemp seed coming up through um, where our big tractor tires were. And so it, there, there's so much to it. <laughs> and it's uh, it's tough to, you know, in, in, in a short amount of time to explain all the nuances. But... You know, the, the Gin Moss certainly didn't want to come up as well as the X-59 and, and wherever our tractor tires were with soil compaction. But then then again, some of it survived the winter. So it's just, <laughs> it's tough. Gotcha. Okay, thanks. How about you, Charlie? Um, yeah, so in our, um, in our clinic here, uh, you know, ag practices, everybody grows corn and beans around us. Um, and... You know, that's the typical rotation for conventional farming and um, hemp is kind of like what we're doing is trying to get more uh, like hemp is a really good um, transitional crop into organic. So and we're seeing a lot of demand for organic on the back end of products. And so um, basically I'm, you know, trying to fit in um, hemp into like corn, bean, alfalfa rotation um, and, and um, try to get, you know, have farmers have an option to make some money um, in that transitional period because that's kind of the toughest part of getting to organic. Um, as far as uh, like planting rates go, um, we're usually around for conventional right around between 25 to 30 pounds to the acre drilled at a quarter inch depth. Um, that depth is a super important piece of all of this. Um, hemp likes to be really shallow. Why you see a lot of um, volunteer hemp come up in the, in the spring is because it, it can just survive on the surface and then does a really good job at rooting itself. Um, and uh, one other method I've said too that I think would work really well is broadcasting and then rolling it. Um, so, uh, and then, yeah, as far as fertilizer, it's a heavy nitrogen sucker. It's basically, I say fertilized, like you would uh, a corn crop. Um, and, uh, and then we are working, we have a, a farm that we work with not too far from us, um, who's converted everything to regenerative no-till. And um, we're doing uh, this year, a couple trials of um, clamping into a cereal rye and uh, doing some roller crimping and, and no tilling. And I think it'll work really well. So it'll be uh, exciting to see what it 
brings out what the lookbook this year. Okay, great. How about you, Gator? Oh, I agree on the planning depth, both of, of Charlie. That is a very critical issue here. We got a lot of sandy loamy soil. So we've got to play with the moisture and get it really ideally perfect after the rain. Run the field cultivator so you're setting to a, a good moisture bed to control the depth. If not, we get a lot of wash when we do get a rain. If the soil's dry, we get a compaction on top get an inconsistent emergence. So that shows all the way through the crop, uh, which causes weeds. And we have a big issue with pig weeds here. Um, so I highly recommend, we, we till everything uh, clean. We have experimented with red clover and Australian peas as cover crops. We planted directly into the peas did not have good success with that because we had a cool spring. The peas started back growing and was more competition. The, the hemp did not sprout as as well as it should have. So we wound up X and that, cut it in and, and replant it. But um, can't emphasize enough on getting that seed placement in the east, very shallow, cover it up so the birds don't get it. Turtle doves love this. Any kind of birds will pick that stuff out of the ground very quickly, but you do have to get it covered. I've broadcasted uh, about 200 acres of it last year. Had good success with that, other than the blades uh, cracking the seeds at planting, so we got a lower germination rate. But what did germinate, germinated really quick and really well. Uh, we drill hours, like he said, roughly a quarter of an inch. Sometimes it, if we don't have a whole lot of moisture, I just let it dribble out on the ground, let the press wheel press it in the top, just to cover it up. Um, that's about it. What about fertility? What are you, um, are you? Average are you corn, uh, depending on the soil samples, we're running between 100 and 150 units or pounds of nitrogen. Uh, 45 on the phosphorus, 70 on the potash, and about 20 on the sulfur is, is kind of where we're at with our land. Okay, great. Bob. Yeah, so our growers, I think on the fertility question, you know, they've, they've learned and, and got this pretty much right on. I mean, uh, we've done some trials here and generally our recommendations to our growers in this area are, you know, we're gonna pretty much for grain follow our corn recommendation uh, for, for fertility, using a soil test for a P and K uh, and then, you know, 100, 125 to 175 units of nitrogen, just depending on what the what the previous crop was, uh, and, and again using the same guidelines for corn. Uh, on on fiber, we go a little bit lower uh, on the on the nitrogen rate, uh, just because we're not trying to fill that protein and uh, and oil in that grain uh, with that. So that's kind of where we're at on fertility. Uh, a couple other comments just, just based on some of the things that they, they've said. I think that that planting depth is very critical. Uh, we started out here uh, going very shallow uh, in that quarter inch. Um, what we have found is that, you know, if you get a, a good conditions immediately after, nice gentle rain, uh, things tend to work out pretty well for you. Um, but we have soils here that crust pretty badly. So if you get a, a hard rain in that soil crust, uh, it will just pretty much destroy uh, your, your emergence. Uh, it's worse than worse than soybean in terms of, of its response to uh, crusting conditions. We're starting to look a little bit closer at planting depth here. Um, I think that because as we move later in the season, uh, when we're planting, we tend to have drier conditions. I think we're probably going to be planting a little bit deeper try to get down into that moisture, but there's a balance there. You have to, to, you have to get it to some moisture to get it to come up, but you don't want to put it down so deep that it's going to delay coming up because as Gator rightly mentioned, uh, if the weeds jump out ahead of it, then you're, you're sunk. Uh, it's got to get up out of the, out of the ground before the weeds because, you know, I, I don't think it's been said yet, but uh, but one thing is there's there's no herbicides that are labeled. 
to use on this stuff. So, I mean, you, you're basically relying on the competition from the crop itself to, to control that. So conventional is probably the easiest way. Conventional tillage is the, the easiest way to get that done. We are starting to work on some, some methods of uh, trying to no-till this crop by growing a cover crop and then rolling it down uh, to, uh, to kill that cover crop uh, and some things like that. So uh, you know, that's, uh, that's kind of where I think we're at right now. Uh, you know, especially in the Southeast, you gotta, you gotta pay attention to, the, to that seeding depth and uh, you know, making sure you're getting those seeds covered up good. Great. Um, so my next question was specifically about planting, um, and, and most of you actually touched on planting as well. Um, um, could you also just, um, just to continue that a little bit more, could you talk about um, the types, uh, um, Gator, I think you mentioned your drilling. So, so it sounds like everyone's drilling at this point. Um, and um, I'm also feeling like I heard that everyone is, is not using irrigation. Can you, um, does anyone want to talk to um, uh, have you have you worked with irrigation? Is it not practical in this type of production system? Um, just talk about you know um, water requirements because because uh, in my experience, those first few weeks, um, you know, it's hemp's pretty sensitive, and this could be more of a southeastern kind of um, problem, but. Uh, it's it's really kind of fragile in those first few weeks and susceptible to overheating and um, so what do you have to say about that Andrew? Yeah you know we we were kind of blown away on our farm um, you know we we only had three inches of rain on it from when we planted it at the end of May until we harvested in October and we had 12 foot tall plants um, as far as irrigation in Montana, you know, we have a pretty serious competition for acreage. And so trying to convince a farmer that has pivots or is irrigated to grow hemp, you have to make a really profound argument to do that for him to give up that, that malt barley contract that he's got with Budweiser. And so you really have to, to wave some money in front of him. And right now, you know, at least on the fiber side, you know, there's just, the money doesn't seem to be there because um, we're not really growing for textiles in Montana. We're growing for non-wovens and for, uh, mo mostly for herd. Um, and, and then of course a seed, but anyway, it's, uh, you know, my experience is only with dry land. I know very few farmers that have grown for, for seed and fiber um, that, that are irrigated. And that's simply because they're, they're making money and they've made money for, you know, 50 years with Budweiser. And so trying to give up, trying to convince them to give up that contract is, is not easy. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, in our neck of the woods, no one's really irrigated around here um, just because of our consistent rain fall. Um, I mean, we see, what, like 40 to inches plus of rain in, in a year. Um, and lots of sunshine, lots of heat, um, loamy soils, but hemp, hemp has a really incredible taproot, um, which is why it can do well in, in dry conditions and it'll just keep looking for moisture and it, it's, it's like, you know, it's, it's a weed. <laughs> um, and so, uh, but uh, the one thing hemp does not do well in um, uh, standing water minutes of standing water will kill hemp. So you can um, water it as much as you want, throw as much uh, nitrogen at it as you want, and it will, you know, grow, you'll get a bigger yield, but if it doesn't have well-drained soil, that's, that's, it's, uh, that's, it's a crypt night, so. Gotcha. Yeah, we don't have anybody around here irrigating hemp. Uh, we irrigated our CBD crops. Uh, solely for the nutrients and, and playing that game. But as far as fiber goes, I don't foresee anybody doing an overhead irrigation. Uh, 
less water consumption than a cotton crop, so I don't see the need as long as you get it. We've got a window in our area uh, between North Carolina and South Carolina <clears throat> between the beginning of May to the end of May to truly get it in the ground, and then you've got to play the weather pattern. That's when our rain ends for the summer. As long as we can get it in time enough to get a couple of inches on it to get a good stand, I feel like we'll succeed fine. As uh, Andrew said, it, it don't need but just a few inches of water and, and it, to get it up out of the ground, get the roots started, and then the tap root's going to take its place and do its job. It's, it's, it'll find the water. Okay. And Bob, has that been your experience too? Yeah, pretty much. The, the, only, the only time that we're seeing much irrigation here is on the CBD crops, um, grain and fiber, more than likely going to be dry land. Okay. Okay, so the plants are in the ground and they're growing well with very little water. Um, and um, what is your process uh, for maintenance and um, what issues have arisen for you during production? Um, are you passing back through? Are you adding additional fertility at any point? Um, or are you struggling with any kind of, kind of uh, uh, disease issues or um, any pest problems? How do you get it to where you're ready to harvest? Yeah, so we, the biggest issue we had was soil compaction. Um, you know, we, we, Seeded it with a 300 horsepower tractor with duals and uh, wherever on our Genma, wherever we had tractor tires and soil compaction, the, the hemp just didn't really want to come up. Um, we also had grasshopper issues. You know, that's not really a big issue if you're, if you're a fiber farmer though, because you're just uh, peeling off the, or <laughs> peeling off the leaves. So we weren't really too concerned about that, but um, we, you know, we really liked it in Montana because we have a big problem with Roundup resistant kochia. It's a weed that we have out here and the hemp can really outcompete it, um, which is wonderful. It creates a canopy and, and makes it so there's really no, uh, no issues with that, with that uh, terrible weed that we're dealing with. Okay, great. Go ahead, Charlie. Um, I was just thinking what I wanted to say, I mean, uh, we have like, you know, when in more rainier um, climates, uh, you can see white mold occurring um, that can also be contributed to soil. Um, there's scarlatinia, there's, there's a couple different plant diseases, but I think um, for the most part, they're all, uh, I think you could connect all of them to soil health. Um, and that's in general with many crops, you know, that's why regenerative farming will produce higher yields and better crops because there's better soil health. Um, and then as far as uh, uh, pests go, I mean, ladybugs seem to love it. Um, and there's uh, yeah, corn borers we've seen. Um, at the end of the day, it's, it, the only like white mold will be the one that will cause loss in in the grain because it'll produce empty shells. Um, so uh, there are some approved herbicides in Canada, like bromoxanil, that is used, but um, nothing has been approved here in, in the states yet. Right. And I should have asked you this as as well, Andrew. It sounds like there's, it's not a very problematic um, plant to grow overall. Is that, would you agree with that? No, as Charlie alluded to earlier, I mean, it's a weed and that's something we, we, <laughs> we shouldn't forget when we're growing it. it. It just wants to grow. And so for the most part, get out of its way and it'll do it. Gotcha. The, the, the biggest issue is, is the harvesting, um, the wrapping that occurs um, you know, a combine goes through it just fine, depending on, you know, how you handle it. But um, it's, uh, yeah, little, little things here and there to stop the wrapping is, is, a, is a big, big deal. And I'm sure there will be equipment 
uh, modification throughout the years. This, this becomes more of a, a crop to <laughs> specific headers or certain screens or things that are more accustomed to it because this stuff is, there's nothing stronger than others. <laughs> Yeah, I agree. There's going to be some some new equipment come along because if you're growing for grain, combine's going to be great. You can run the group, not a problem. It's designed for grain. Uh, as far as what we're focused on for textiles, there's only a certain part of that stalk that we want at a certain time. Uh, but if you go into a tri crop or a uh, dual purpose crop, and we're still trying to collect that fiber, we still need to harvest our section of that stalk the way we need it for our processing equipment. But still collect the heads. So there's there's going to be development on this equipment, and like he said, it, it will cause issues in your equipment if you don't pay attention to the rapage. Uh, it's very very strong. As far as the diseases, we have a big issue with pythium uh, from the tobacco crops here, and nematodes uh, is a seems to be an issue. But pythium is our biggest problem, which starts about just a few weeks after life or after it emerges, especially if we get a heavy rain and a little bit of standing water, it has set it off really quick. Also, we've had deep root pythium uh, down around 18 to 20 inches in the ground. It'll be spores. And that one spore in the ground can multiply up through the plant, kill the top of the plant, and it's done. So we have seen loss from that. Uh, and botrytis in the bud. Other than that, that's about all of the, the real issues we've had as far as hindering the growth of the crop. Okay. So we've had uh, here, uh, we see some leaf spot diseases, uh, but it seems to be pretty resilient to those. Uh, you know, you, you lose a little bit of leaf, uh, leaf area, but uh, Hemp, is, hemp seems to be pretty resilient to that. Um, we've seen uh, we've seen some issues um, in a few cases with some uh, fusarium head blight, uh, which of course brings up concerns for the for the ultimately for the grain and the toxins that might be in it. Um, and that's something that we're monitoring to you know try to to get a better handle on just how big of a problem um, that is is ultimately going to be. Um, the other issue that we've had, uh, probably more so in our CBD hemp, but I think if we if we had more grain out there, we would be seeing it as well. Is uh, is corn earworms? Um, they really like to get in those those flower heads and burrow around in there. And uh, I think if we had a higher density of, of grain being grown, uh, we'd definitely be seeing problems with with that based on just what we've seen with, with our CBD hemp uh, around the the, the area. Um, the one that probably worries me the most uh, as we increase acreage, if we were to increase acreage uh, and, and have, uh, you know, be going back into the same fields uh, with, with hemp, uh, even after a couple of years, is southern blight. Um, we've had a few cases where we've seen southern, southern blight come in and, and just takes it, and basically takes it down. Um, so, you know, I think that's something that Right now, um, you know, from my perspective, we may not be seeing a lot of these things because you know it's been a long time since hemp has grown in many of these places. But as you increase the acreage uh, and you come back to the same fields uh, with with hemp in subsequent years, we may start to see some of these pest problems building up more over over time. Hopefully, at the same time that's happening, we'll also be building a base of tools. Um, there are some a, a few fungicides that are now labeled organic, uh, primarily bio-based fungicides, and there are a few uh, insecticides that are being labeled uh, as well in some areas. And so, hopefully, you know, as the as we do see some of these pest problems emerging, we'll be ultimately building out our our toolbox a list of tools that we have to combat those things um, as, as we go. Great, thank you. Um, so uh, let's just um, 
touch on uh, harvesting and a little bit more. And also um, if anyone has um, uh, got, um, talk, let's talk about the redding process too, because I think that's kind of something that's kind of unique to this crop, um, you know, and, and um, I hear lots of different input on how long reading should happen, and it, and it's a it's a product of a lot of different factors coming together, moisture and and other um, elements. But um, let's talk about you know um, how you're harvesting for grain and fiber, and and what your experience with reading has been. Yeah, so we we just ran it through our combine for the for the grain. So we we took our case combine and tried to cut as, t as close to the top of the plant as we could and uh, pull off that seed. Um, as Charlie alluded to, there is wrapping issues. Um, there, there's no part of this plant when you harvest it that doesn't suck. I mean, that's the bottom line. There's just, it, it's, it's difficult to deal with. Um, you know, that's why in Canada they have fire trucks that just follow around the combines that are farming hemp. Um, and that's happening just north across the border from me. Um, yeah, and, and so the, you know, the harvesting side, we, with our, with our fiber variety, we just ran it through um, a swather uh, with a draper header, um, and that sucked too. I mean, there's no doubt about it, but uh, we got through it and just took our time, and uh, we weren't in a big hurry because we were already done harvesting all the rest of our commodities. Um, but yeah, this, this, this plant, I mean, it's an amazing plant, but it, it does suck with, with running all the equipment that we normally run through it. Um, that's not to say you can't do it. It just, it, it's not the most fun, <laughs> most fun adventure on the farm. So. You're still working it out. <laughs> yeah, no, we, we are. And, and that's, oh, and then the redding. Um, so for us, you know, redding, I, I don't really care that much about redding and I'm one of the few that doesn't. And that's simply because our processing system that we have, we don't need it to be a redded, decor redded material to decorticate it. We don't really play by the decortication rules. We have a, a system that we pulverize the whole plant and separate the bass from the herd, whether it's decorticated or not. We run a lot of different CBD varieties, we run seed varieties. So the redding process doesn't matter as much to me. We just want dry material. Um, that being said, you know, I, I did have some hemp that I redded and that was, to, that was honestly just because we got a snowstorm um, right, at, right after we swathed it. So I didn't get it off the ground in time, but we, we don't really care about redding. Um, and I'm probably one of the only hemp fiber processors that'll say that. Okay, good to know. <laughs> I, I second that too. Um, I mean, I think that we're going to see a lot of things come out of uh, the fiber side that don't really need the long links. I mean, I would even argue that we could probably make, you know, polyester style um, products from short fibers. Um, so I think the long fibers and the term of decortication is an old school method. Um, and it's really just separation. Um, could be wrong too. The textiles, it's still a lot of stuff that needs to evolve. But um, so the, the field readiness is more of, uh, I think, just kind of like a luxury that you can like cut it and let it lay and take the time to get to it. Um, and then, uh, yeah, as far as equipment goes, um, I've experienced um, the same uh, struggles that Andrew was saying, but we've also seen um, great success as well with. Uh, treating it really similarly to wheat um, and it's just all about a tiny thing to make sure it doesn't get too dry um, but it was, uh, <laughs> it was a, a farmer we work with around here uh, they treated it like that and used it combined like butter so it was uh, it was really nice to hear that and uh, know that it's it's possible I mean it's it's like no other. It's, it's no different than any other crop. You just have to be careful because those fibers are so strong that you let them get too dry or built up and stuff. So, <clears throat> okay. How about you, Gator? Yeah, we've had the same equipment issues. Uh, the first year we've done it, <clears throat> we jammed a, a damn near brand new John Deere slam up. Uh, it wrapped the rotor. <laughs> 
the throw chains, everything. It took the man two days to get everything cut out of the inside of the combine. He had jammed it up so tight. That gives you any idea how strong it is. I mean, it just it is unreal. If you don't pay attention to what you're doing, you can really damage some expensive equipment. Uh, our process, I, I feel the sickle bar, laying it down in a, and straight billing it is our best uh, at the moment as far as matching our decortication. <clears throat> Reading, in, in my opinion, on the textile has a, a major factor in it as far as the quality of fiber, depending on the garment that's being made. Uh, reading does, it will help uh, processing costs. When you get to the gumming on further down the processing, you can beat the shit out of it, get that stuff off of it if you really wanted to. But you're breaking that fiber down, so when you add these chemicals to it, to the gummit, it's going to make it that much more brittle and you can't blend it with anything at that point in time so there'll be grades of fiber all the way through uh, but I, I do like three to six days of rating uh, it, it does make a difference on our side of what we're doing on the industry side okay so most of the work we're doing is, is, you know, I have hundreds of small plots with all these different cultivars and everything. So the uh, majority of our harvesting is is actually by hand. And uh, Andrew, I'd say my crew really says says that harvesting hemp sucks <laughs> when they have to when they have to handle it by hand. But uh, yeah, but we have seen with some of our growers, uh, you know, I've been out with with some of them uh, and and help to unwrap some shafts and a few things like that. So definitely what these guys are telling you is, is, is true. It is a, it is a, a tough plant uh, to, to deal with and harvesting. Okay. And um, I'm just seeing here in the chat, um, it, it, is anyone using a Kemper head to cut the stalks? Is that, no? Uh, I'm not, no. Kemper head, no. What does a hemper head look like? Uh, Kemper head. Um, head. It's got the rotating teeth in it, like for. Uh, oh, 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 like the claws choppers. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's a. Uh, I think it's uh, pretty popular in Europe. Um, basically, and I think that that will be a popular head here eventually, um, because you can take your, you can, your drapers up high and you can take your heads off to like three feet and then you can cut your stalks and windrow them at the same time. So it, it saves, it saves quite a bit of driving around and having to cut it again, where you can just go out and bail it. So. Yeah. Yeah. And I would say Kelly too, I'm, I'm not using it, but I do have clients up in Canada that are tri cropping. In other words, they're, they're CBD seed and fiber and mm -hmm. they're using heads like that. Okay, good to know. Okay, so um, we've just planted, taken care of, and harvested our hemp. So now let's talk a little bit about um, some, does anyone want to share, um, and don't, you're, you're not um, required to answer this question, but uh, what would you say your worst failure in hemp is to date? Um, relevant to to farming not on the business side <laughs> yeah um, I, I I mean for me Kelly it's it's pretty simple it's the supply chain that's the failure I mean we, we need to have more more hemp in people's hands and we need to be able to to find more in market so we can grow it I mean that's we know that I mean our our friends to the north of us are growing a whole parcel of it um, but, you know, as far as failures in farming, we had soil compaction issues, we had grasshoppers, but man, it grows like a weed, it just wants to grow. So we, we were very lucky that um, we were able to grow a large amount of hemp, but now it's just a matter of uh, getting more end markets for it so that we can actually sell it and uh, design more processing facilities built around uh, hemp fiber and, and seed. Okay. Anyone else? Oh, I, oh, yeah, no, I say just on the uh, agronaut, like the the farming side of things, I think, um, like I said, working the the stocks back into the ground was a, 
that was a big mistake, big lesson learned there. Um, and yeah, and then like when it comes to the grain side, I mean, if you're going to be using this for food, um, handling the grain is, is of utmost importance. Um, and like, you know, using augers to convey the grain around can uh, be enough to ruin the, the crop. I mean, we're trying to develop methods to make use of grain that's even, you know, spoiled if not, or, or not spoiled, but like the uh, crack seed. Um, you deal with a lot of oxidation that happens in the oil um, because of those uh, polyunsaturated fats, they turn into free fatty acids and um, it's yeah, supply chain and, and just, you know, getting the whole entire infrastructure together. Um, I, I think to the legality with CBD and all this, it just, it all needs to be recognized as cannabis because we're putting it into all these different categories and it doesn't make sense because it's all one plant. So, yeah. So, um, Charlie, with the issue of, of this turning, trying to turn the stalks into the ground, what was your solution? Are you burning this, the stubs now or what are you doing? No, that's what we, we bail them up. And that's what we have our farmers bail. Oh, okay. We've developed the processing for receiving those bales and turning them into a cleaned herd and fiber because we had markets for those. So, um, yeah, it's make, we want to make use. We want to make use of that product because it's there's so much value in it, and it's going to be treated as a waste. Okay. Thank you. I don't know if this is a, if, as much of a problem up, up north. Um, maybe these guys can comment on it. But one of the issues that, that we have with harvesting for grain is because of the, the way these flowers mature from the, from the bottom up. Um, as, the, as the bottom of the flower is, is maturing, we have a lot of shadow. And so we have to harvest while it's still green, pretty much. And one of our biggest disasters, I think it was the second year maybe, uh, we grew some, some grain here and we harvested this stuff green and we put it in a bin and we had air blowing on it as hard as we could and it just molded. I mean, the whole thing. And it was a mess to, mess to clean out. But, you know, that is, a, that is something that I think our, our grain growers here have to, to face a little bit is the fact that because of the shatter issue, they feel like they're forced to harvest uh, when it's green and, and has a lot of moisture to it. And I don't know, you know, maybe in Montana, your conditions are, will allow you to have a little more field drying so you don't face that issue. Yeah, we, we don't. We're, we're pretty doggone lucky that we're pretty arid when we, uh, when we do harvest it. And um, yeah, we, we don't have humidity. That's one thing we definitely don't, do, don't have out here. That will be, that is, that, that is going to be probably the biggest contributing factor um, towards like what different varieties are going to do well in certain areas. And I find, I think that spots that are more humid south, um, they're, I don't know if you're going to be able to grow grain because we see that issue too. We'll get wet falls sometimes and it's, I mean, everybody here has got big massive bins with dryers on them. And, uh, but if you, you know, you have to get your hemp on air within 30 minutes of harvesting, if you're going to straight cut it and, um, and on air, like immediately and down to 9%, otherwise, yeah, it'll mold. Gator, how about you? Do you want to share a, a failure or have you been successful all the way through? Uh, like I said earlier, I, I can tell you what not to do better than I can tell you what to do from the failures. Uh, in some cases, I think that's the best way to learn. Um, but in our region, I've, another reason we focused on the textile side of things is because of our humidity. And, and as he said, in the grain, we do have issues with that uh, later in the season, as well as hurricanes. Our biggest disaster was the 1,300 acres that got wiped out by a hurricane. No crop insurance, still paid farmers out of our pockets. Uh, nothing we could do. So we focus more on the textile so it could be harvested at an earlier time, not, not as mature as the grains and, and the tri-crop and stuff. 
as an insurance if we do have a, a hurricane brewing on the coast out there and South Carolina's going to be in that same risk pattern. Okay, good. That's, that's good input. And um, I realized that, you know, we have, our farmers are kind of spread around the country here. And I, and, you know, that was um, partly because, um, you know, I was trying to find farmers with, you know, plenty of experience, but, you know, that is something to keep in mind that, you know, we're, we're talking about um, definitely different climates and, um, uh, you know, what might work well where the you know Midwesterners are is is not going to be is not going to translate um, well to here and that actually brings me to my um, I think gonna, this is going to be my last question before we try to maybe grab David are there any questions in the chat yet or um, uh, do you have a few noted or uh, well yeah I, I, while we're touching on that subject we just brought up um, the last question was uh, feed space and we talked about pounds and all of the grain drill. I've, I'm assuming y'all using seven inch, seven and a half inch row spacing with um, how many yeah. seeds per foot? What's a what's a good number there to give a more specific answer than the pounds per acre kind of thing? It, it's we've got seed germinating every well, almost touching, uh, and we, we're averaging thirty pounds to the acre to fifty four pounds to the acre. Uh, the thirty pounds that we're planting has twenty four thousand beef count per pound uh, to 54 pounds per acre is only averaging 14,000 seed per acre. So you'll get a little bit more since between the, the 54 than you will to 30, believe it or not. Um, anyone else want to chime in on that? I had before this one last question. All seven inch. Okay, so the... Um, the one thing, because we are talking about the two different regions, we have representatives from different regions here. You know, the Southeast is much more suited to smaller, relatively, um, farming operations. So um, does anyone have any uh, experience in working in farmer cooperatives? Um, and can you just talk about that for like a minute, uh, you know, what your experience has been and, and um, you know, how that's worked? Yeah, we're designing a, a large fiber facility for a cooperative right now. Um, and that seems to be a pretty good model for farmers um, because it, it gives them some ownership in it too. And, and you know, when commodity prices are rising, it, it's just, it's hard for old farmers to decide to, to grow hemp over something they're going to make money on. Um, and so that has been successful um, in our view in Montana, um, we're working with many different uh, interested processors throughout the country and, and several of them are, are considering a cooperative model um, with the farming because it has been very difficult to find acreage um, because, you know, it's tough to pencil um, to, <laughs> to pencil hemp when when you're able to sell corn as much as you are. Um, and so, you know, a lot of people have been trying to put more money in their farmer's pockets so they can actually build a processing facility and supply some of the contracts that are out there for the non-woven industry, um, the herd industry. Um, and so it's it's starting to, the, the industry is starting to pick up, but, uh, you know, I guess, uh, yeah, in, in my view, a cooperative model makes a lot of sense with hemp. And it's appropriate for, you know, for this side, this part of the country to keep, um, you know, to allow farmers with smaller acreage to, you know, still participate in the industry. Um, anyone else? Um, Gator, are you part of a cooperative? No, ma'am, I, I haven't been. I've I kind of been a lone ranger uh, okay. up to this point trying to get the infrastructure to support that if it comes along because that was something we were lacking here uh there was no real development on what we were going to do after we grew it so i just i focused on that now we're at a stage where we can do that gotcha yeah it's all it's all kind of coming together isn't it <laughs> yes ma'am um so there was one more burning question and this is kind of the um you know I haven't heard this question a lot so as much this year, but um, 
Does anyone have any anything to say about growing fiber or grain in proximity to CBD plots and the issue of cross pollination? <laughs> I see um, lots of smiles. <laughs> I can touch on that because I I kind of did before um, with what I was saying. Um, seeing still high yields of CBD. Um, it, you know, in 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 Minnesota, there's so much. Um, there's so much ditch weed from when it was legal to grow during the war. Um, and so there's, there's just mass amounts of pollen in the air inadvertently, even if there wasn't hemp fields planted. So that's what we saw um, in our CBD crops the last couple of years. I mean, we vigilantly scoured for males, but it didn't matter. <laughs> I mean, they were still getting heavily seeded out. And, but I mean, what we were, what, we developed is, um, you know, we have in-house seed cleaning and everything, and and we were able to we we com we 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 hand cut some of it, we combined most of it, and then we ended up just you know separating the biomass from the grain before we bring it to our CBD process. And I mean, we're seeing um, quite a bit of of grain yield and still 10% CBD. So that's what we're doing. Um, we're, we're just actually planting high CBD varieties this year, um, just like you would a grain crop. And uh, just are gonna swath it and, and uh, combine it and separate it and that's that. So um, I have a very different um, opinion when it comes to cross-pollination and um, feminized seed. I, I think everybody's kind of looking at it wrong, but that's my own personal view, so. Mm. Okay. I would tend to agree with, with Charlie in that, uh, you know, I don't think that the, the, the negative impact of pollination and seed set is as big as what it was made out to be. I mean, in, in 2019, when we had a lot of people all over Kentucky that we had 26,000 acres, 95% uh, of it was CBD. And some of these people were just, I mean, they went nuts if they saw one male plant or one male flower in the field, like it was gonna ruin everything. And I don't think it's, I don't think it's that bad. Where I do think we will run into some conflicts, um, we don't have it yet here in Kentucky, but in, in areas where you have a legal adult use cannabis industry uh, and you have people who are trying to grow for flower you know, just not, not ground material or whatever, but just flower, buds, those kinds of things. Um, there will likely be, could be some conflicts uh, where you have those types of grows going on uh, and people who are trying to grow um, for, uh, for grain and fiber. Uh, so that's where I, I think some of those conflicts could, could ultimately come in. Okay. That's great input. Okay, David, um, we have, um, I wanna be respectful of everyone's time. Um, we are scheduled till 7.30, we've got five minutes. Is there, are there any questions in the chat that um, you think we should get to publicly? And, and for, we're gonna save the questions out of the chat and, um, you know, uh, try to, include some answers in a, you know, when I send out the recording too. So, so don't worry if you don't get your question answered right now. Uh, Kelly seems to be the, the long topic that really hasn't been touched on has been the question of late and that's price. Anybody have any contracts? What's the going rate? Yeah, no, I can, I can speak to that. Um, you know, we're sending out a bunch of product, Um, and so the herd would range anywhere from, uh, well, I guess what you would pay your farmer would be probably uh, five to 10 cents a pound in the bale form. Um, that's really what makes sense. The herd, it depends on your market, um, depends on your quality, but if you're in the animal bedding industry, you could be anywhere from 25 cents a pound to 40 cents a pound wholesale. Um, and if you're in the bioplastics industry, you're making a food grade product, you could be over a dollar a pound. Um, it really does range pretty broadly. Fiber side, honestly, if you would have asked me this question two months ago, I would have said, 
I haven't seen a domestic uh, large contract for fiber. And I'm talking about non-woven large contract, like uh, tens of thousands of pounds a month, but I did see one and about 65 cents a pound for clean, very clean fiber that's anywhere from uh, one to two inch in length. When you say clean, um, you mean already processed? I, 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 sim I just mean there's no hurt in it. And that's, that's the big challenge with processing, right, is getting clean fast. And we have a system with our partner Forsbergs that allows folks the opportunity to sell 95, 99% pure bast. In other words, there's no herd, no dust in it. It's just simply the outer core. Right. Which is the biggest challenge in processing right now. Yep. Is, yeah. Um, um, price, uh, we're, so we're contracted um, with our farmers uh, at 55 cents a pound for conventional for grain and $1.10 a pound for organic. Um, and then we're paying farmers um, around seven to 10 cents a pound for bales. Um, so that's that's kind of what our, uh, that's what our contract outlines. And we have uh, planting seed available at um, about a dollar 55 cents a pound. Um, out of uh, North Dakota. Um, so it's not, if there are any farmers on here, we are still looking for, for acres, um, especially organic acres. So um, yeah, feel free to reach out to us. Great. And um, maybe the speakers, um, before we jump off tonight, could you put your name again, your company and your, uh, maybe, um, just the name of your company so people can find you a little more easily. I can, I'll, I'll actually include that in a follow-up email too. In fact, don't worry about that. I'll, I'll send an email out with everybody's contact information afterwards. That's easier. Um, Gator or Bob, did you have anything to say about pricing? Uh, we're currently working with Biofuel and we're, we're doing a $500 an acre contract. Uh, straight to the farmer, supplying the seeds uh, and, and consulting them on, on the proper way to get it in the ground. Uh, we're close to having that full, but we would, we've got some room left uh, here for the North Carolina area for the transportation issues that we're having right now. Hopefully that won't cause the prices to go up too much with the, the fuel shortage here, but uh, it's kind of our approach to it. Okay. Great. So that is pretty much all the time we have. Um, I would like to thank um, all of our speakers. I really appreciate your time tonight and it's been a really great session. Um, and for those of you who didn't get your questions answered, like I said, we'll try to get to those. Um, if the speakers don't mind, could you hang just Wait, um, can I have like three more of your minutes before you jump off? I have one more question for you. Um, and then to everyone else, thank you for joining us. And, um, you know, uh, we'll be in touch. There's some, another webinar coming up for specifically on processing. And then we're also gonna do something uh, for, to really dive deeper into this contracts issue. So um, thanks again, and take care. <laughs>